Hi, Gabriel. Hi, Gabe. Gabriel, can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. Oh boy, all right. I got my team blue on. Yay. It's a lovely day. It is. It's gorgeous out. I'm gonna after this, I'm gonna go for a walk with my sister at <clears throat> one of the local forest preserves. Yeah. Enjoy the weather while we can. Yes, I did my version of al fresco dining in the backyard for a couple of hours. Nice. Yeah, it felt really good to be out. I've noticed though the birds are just not around as much. There's only one little bird I heard. Not the uh -huh. night birds that you hear, at least in our neighborhood, and then even the different kinds of birds that are there in the morning. So my husband is has turned into a bird fanatic. Uh -huh. um, and so we have tons of bird feeders and uh, we're still getting some, but no, a lot of them have left. <clears throat> we had a big group of um, grackles flying through the other day, but um, yeah, they're they're dwindling, you know. But that's what they do; they go to warmer climates. Um, I'm going to admit we got Patty, Meg, and Emily. So. Um, I can't remember. We don't need to make Patty a um, host. We just need to spotlight her when the time yeah. comes. Yes. Right. Okay. So I, I have somewhat understood, if not actually starting to master, recording the Zoom talks, saving them a Zoom file, and then being able to send them in Gmail because it will make it google drive because the file is usually too big to try to send us an attachment on yahoo or something else yeah so i'm really getting that down proud of myself another, yeah another, all this we're all getting better at this technology hey welcome everybody i'm gonna run and get my gita i didn't grab it so i'll be right back hello Un unmute yourself and say hello 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 Hello, Patty. How about you, Meg? Can you unmute yourself? Hello. Good. Thanks. Nice to have you come out and play today. Yeah, sounds like fun. All right. It is fun. I'm having fun. Good. No pressure. Just. Oh, good to know. Right. Robert is here. Let's get him in here. Good to have another man. Alyssa, I see you're in, but we're no photo for you yet. Connecting audio. There we go. How are we feeling today? Beautiful day, no? Oh, it's gorgeous out. You out with the dog already, Patty? No, she's been she's been here with me all day. Uh -huh. <laughs> After class, then we're going out. Mm -hmm. I had. I hope it won't be the last, but you know, al fresco dining in the backyard. It was very lovely this morning. Yes. So trying to take advantage of the mild temperatures. Right. Um, yeah, I would. All righty. So well, I think there's only eight. I think there's only eight of us supposedly signed up, and doesn't matter. Uh, I'm going to start on time. Get your question. Do you have a, a Bhagavad Gita to um, study along with? Yeah, great. So that'll be that'll be the initial part of our program here. That's exciting. What? Oh, another one, Heidi. Here we go. Hi, welcome to you too. Hello, Heidi. Hi. Glad you're here. Thank you. I am glad to be here too. Is anybody tuning in from another city or another state, or is everybody local? Illinois, Chicago suburb. Oak Park. Meg, where are you coming in from? Uh, Glenview. Glenview. Okay. Yeah, I'm like right up by Oak Park. No, nobody knows. If you say Galewood, nobody knows. But if you say Oak Park, people know. Ah, yeah. Alyssa, yes? Good, unmute yourself and check in. So get your geek together. All right, so here's what I do. 
Um, let's get us in a uh, meditative frame. I'm going to chant Om and <clears throat> the invocation. Get us going. <clears throat> if you touch all of your fingers together, so the pads of the thumb get a little bit on every hand, that's mm -hmm. called Shukri, S H U K R I. Shukri Mudra. Can you say that? Shukri. 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 Yeah. So <clears throat> this is an immune system strengthener. You know, they make extravagant claims for a lot of stuff, which is really great. An immune system strengthener, soothing your nerves, mm -hmm. helping your digestive fire. Because remember, every time you touch a thumb to a different part of, or a different finger, there are circuits that are being closed, they would say. And they have a whole science of, of mudras. We don't have anything that's really that em empirical. Hi, welcome. So, Shukri Mudra. And um, at the root of your thighs, just close your eyes for a second. Take a few breaths. Settle into being here. See how long it takes you to get into the oriental brain, as my teacher would say, which means the more witnessing part of you, not the part of you that's trying to advance the story, figure things out, come to a solution, make anything different in any way than just the way everything is as it is. Yogena chitasya padena vacham Malam sarirasya chavaidya kenam Yopakarotam pravaram muninam Patanjalim pranjalir anatosmit Abahu purushakaram Shankat chakrasidarinam Sahasra shirasam swetam Ranamami patanjalim Arihiyom. Bring your hands into Namaste, bow your head, and salute the essence of yoga within yourself. Keeping the eyes closed, bring your head up on your spine. Relax your palms in your lap, back into Shukri Mudra, and then gently open your eyes. Wow, we made it for another escapade together. Well, as you know, I am very happy to be alive, uh, all things considered, and uh, I hope that you are too. As you know, that's a really important aspect of you showing up. You know, everything is a mutual creation. And um, sometimes we come to class or workshops or wherever, and, you know, our burdens are heavier in that moment. And so we know we go there to heal. But sometimes we go to these things, what I call the temporary initiatory village, and our burdens are not so heavy. And then we come to get empowered to serve further. We learn how to heal. So whether you need to be healed because the burdens are heavy or whether you come to sharpen your own healing skills, not only for yourself, but for everyone else who you meet, um, I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to have a chance to play. So let's play together. So here's the way I'm gonna play at the beginning. Here's the way the, the format, right? It's like an hour of kind of my Dharma my, my wife calls it, oh, my, the word bloat. 
first first she smacks me in my tummy you know where like i put on my quarantine 15 and then she hears me like do my dharma stick oh yeah the word bloat yeah excuse me i go to i can go to my men's group where they can call me a word wizard yeah. <laughs> i don't need to take this at home <laughs> so, yeah i'm fine anyway so for those of you who don't know me i don't know myself so i don't know how this is going to help you but first of all I like to think of myself as a yoga provocateur. So I'm being out front about this. I'm not apologizing. I'm just giving you facts. You don't have to hire a private detective. I took so many drugs it pickled my brain when I was younger, no doubt. And some people might have said, you're a mutant. You're a deviant of our species. That just provoked me. <laughs> I'm someone who hates dogma. And yoga is a big enough umbrella to fit a lot of interpretations and st still leave you coming up with, it's a mystery in the end. Does anybody understand, Brahman? And my teachers have taught me, stop being so interested in the ascending fantasy, in moving up the chakras and the enlightening experience, the attachment that we have to that idea of the higher planes and the separation it does in terms of dualistic thinking about the lower planes. I have accepted the first three chakras. I've invited them all in for tea. Or as Joseph Campbell says, have you come to grips with the aspect of your malodorous, lecherous, and carnivorous self? If you haven't, you're not getting the benefits of those aspects of yourself, and you probably are skewing your relationship with those aspects of yourself that in a certain way helps you feel your humanity, and therefore you're less narcissistic about how wonderful your ego that doesn't really exist is. So I have accepted, you know, all those chakras in my humanity because it keeps me from being too inflated. And also, as you see, I've married a, someone. Patty is always saying, don't poke the bear. You know, I married, you know, the magnet on the refrigerator is, sorry, because after watching last night, Mike Pence continuing to interrupt women, I have to say this. So on the magnet on my refrigerator is like a guy talking in the forest. And it says, if a man talks in the forest and a woman isn't there to hear him, is he still wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody gets it. Okay, fine. So, <laughs> so I'm here to play. Um, but yoga for me never was just an aspirin for the mind. The vision of yoga and the vision of society that I certainly had coming of age uh, was something much larger, much larger, including a more, I guess, cosmic awareness is a weird word because it's a pretty big cosmos, but order, the sense of like tuning back to the order. That, that's, that was lost in my generation and rediscovered through the material chemicals um, of LSD. But then again, you know, seeing the vision doesn't make you it. You still have to do the work. And so that's where the yoga path usually begins. They don't get overly judgmental about continuing to take intoxicants, but you understand that anything you do to your system moves your chemicals in some way, whether you stand on your head or do kapalabhati or change your diet, it's just chemical shifts. So if, I'm not a dogmatist about that, but it teaches that yoga is an art form. It's something that you make alive by doing it. And it isn't just the postures, it's your whole lifestyle. It's how you understand every aspect of their four modes of you know, appealing to the part of us that thinks, the part of us that feels, the part of us that acts, and the part of us that contemples. So that's why you have the Raja Yoga, the Yana Yoga, the Bhakti Yoga, and the Karma Yoga. It appeals to different styles. So if that's a way that resonates with you, you, get, you, you, you put more emphasis on that in a dominant way. And I've always argued for, if you want to go to the East and do that, it's fantastic, but you don't have to leave the West. You don't have to leave your own ethnicity, your own nothing. Your spirit is omnipresent. So once you get that connection to really embody where you are, living spirit, as you understand it, and like a 12-stepper, as you currently understand it, it's a mystery. Nobody knows. So this is the best you can do. And remember, organized religion which is supposed to be a certain kind of embodiment of the mystical or spiritual experience has done heinous things. And religious moderates accept that all the time. We're in a new era. The spirituality has to evolve to make sense in a global diverse situation. Again, 
Yoga has that vision, even though metaphorically we can, we can project it on the vision, but it was historically bound to other things and aspects of their society, which you have to question as well, right? So there's no other golden age. And uh, we have to domesticate intuition in our own way. So it's an art form. It's something that you, you make your yoga practice, not only with the actual yoga techniques that you use from India or wherever you think you find a path that leads you back to harmony, but you start inventing your own. You become more your own person. You adapt the things that you've learned in your life, your triumphs and, and, your, and your defeats. And if you meet a teacher who says to you, I want your experience of yoga to be more than mine ever was, then you got the bug because you want somebody to bless you, to like root for you, to go in that direction because they see, yeah, you got some fire. This guy's on fire. Right? Mr. Elisa Keys, you know, you have to have that part of you that's just putting it totally out there. Um, anything less than I've always said is just not going not to help you. So, but when you do that, so this is what you've got to understand. And if you want to, you want to project Nadi Shodhana on that, you want to think that alternate nostril breathing is going to get you into this balanced state, fine. But if you want to understand like, you know, left brain, right brain, dyad metaphor, fine. When you open up the right brain, exploratory possibilities become available to you. It's as simple as that. And then you have this spectrum of what our DNA is capable of potentially perceiving. But the left brain is tuned to a very different world. It reduces everything and tries to grasp at what it hopes will be certainties. But the only security is the false security. So within that, you have to develop a mature articulation of what you're doing with your practice and how it helps you cope in your daily life, give you strength and resilience and so forth. You become the conscience of the world. It's very hard to turn off that part of you that morally wants to live to the best standard you're capable of and keep refining it if possible so you have some humility and not arrogance about I've reached the best I'm capable of giving and keep understanding your faults and the humility that happens when you, you see um, where you're not. And then you still aspire. You still want to be a better you. And hopefully hang out with people who support that for, in you. So if you don't follow this, remember, at your own peril, yoga is teaching you a mythology. Right? It's not the song about the mythology. It is the mythology. Do you want to believe that story? Or do you want to believe the story of what's happening in what we call material reality in America at this time. And I always say, make sure you watch news from foreign countries so you know everything doesn't revolve around America and you can get outside of this historical moment geographically here and keep broadening your awareness of us all around nonetheless. If you don't want to be seduced back into viewing what I would call a self-limiting perspective, and you have to let go of a part of yourself instead of trying to improve yourself and swing with it in a very different way. That is really owning yoga. Not practicing according to what you think yoga is. But this is the basic idea behind one of my ongoing themes. What do you practice? Because whatever you practice, you'll get good at. In fact, you'll get so good at it that it will combat demoralization. That doesn't mean you'll never have a moment where there's an, a, a shit-eating grin on your face. Of course not. But once you learn that positive connections last longer, then the fewer negative disconnections that you have will be quickly resolved or more quickly resolved than they were in the past. So again, remember Yoga to me is not some happy-go-lucky, blithely cheerful go naivete into the future. I don't know who you're talking to. Or bad examples. Yoga is about your mundane pursuits in spiritual garments. Anything less than that, you're not integrating the path. You're creating a difference between my life and some compartmental spiritual life that's somewhere else. It's how you comport yourself. It's how you interact. It's the choices you make. It's the joy you bring. It's the compassion you have. So I'm not cheerfully unconcerned about the future. Because is a part of me 
in the drama living for the future? Of, of course, I want some things to happen. I'm not ready to go. But am I here right now doing everything to focus my attention, being as fully alive as I can with every single connection that I have with people through my daily life? Well, what else is there to do? So <clears throat> yoga will help, in my opinion, to strengthen your therapeutic relationships on all different levels. Because You don't have to be actually literally with a therapist to have a therapeutic relationship with people. If you start to revision your interaction with each person who you meet, and realize something might be revealed to me as a result of being with this person. I don't know. They have a completely different life than me and has done unbelievable things I can't even imagine. And I don't know if we're gonna like jive with our chemistry to try to pull them out of, but you know, I'm open. I'm open to, you know, I never met this person before. I wanna meet with warmth. I wanna meet with rapport. I wanna meet with the possibility that something could be generated. That's a rich hope I have for the future. I'm giving you a, an inkling. I'm, I'm about to go on a, a, a Dharma tour virtually before the election. And my topic is inoculation against nihilism. Colon, the future, rich with hope. Because you got to say it good, because a lot of people don't know how to say it good. Say it good. OK, everybody, that's our response. Right. So for me, practicing yoga has inspired expectations of help. All along the way, I've had people assisting me and helping me. All along the way. Teamwork, networking, call it whatever you want, community. All right. It's been part of the path. It's what we do. And each one of us is responsible for maintaining the fire. Like I would say, you know, keep the fire burning in the father's house when I'm in the men's group. We understand. Even if there's nowhere in there to feel it, someone has to stoke the fires and keep it going. And that's us, right? And not only us, right? we're not just the only tribe of the future. We have a, we have a, have a lot of clans that are supporting us. Um, but most of all, if you choose to practice right, and make it regular, reality is helping you. It's helping you. It's affording you an opportunity to practice and rehearse. And when you realize what an edge that gives you to help out in the world, not only does it give you resilience and perseverance, but we all have to interact with a lot of other us who are, are not doing so well in a world where we're doing well and a lot of other people are not. And if you're practicing yoga, it just softens your heart to that realization that you want to help out in some way. So, so that needs first checking in. Now, the Bhagavad Gita, my God. I remember when I first encountered the Gita, I was living in San, San Anselmo, California. And there was a very, very small, it could fit in your palm, Gita produced by some printing company in India. And just, I remember the first time I read it and, and you know, before I had, had been introduced really to the concepts of reincarnation or karma um, and, and the various mystical things. My, my experience was very lukewarm in terms of the re organized religious tradition. My, my parents didn't celebrate uh, an orthodox observance um, in the Jewish tradition. And of the things that I had heard, read, even up to like Western civilization, uh, philosophy, Western civ in, in, in college in you know, mid to late 60s, the mysticism didn't come through at all. So there was something flat. And of course, that's what the drugs opened up. There's the journey to the East. And uh, in these three chapters that I wanted to just share with you, it continues from the first three chapters, if you remember, where they were laying the whole outline of, he's teaching them the first about the virtue of work. Remember, of course, the, to recapitulate, just like recap, hit, hit recap or skip recap if you're on Netflix. No, no, we're hitting recap. Arjuna doesn't want to do the fight. So Krishna starts to explain to him first the virtue of work. That was the first chapter. Uh, and then it was the religion of knowledge, how metaphysical knowledge is the thing that's really important, not just worldly knowledge. And then the religion of work, of renouncing work. So now he starts introducing the concept of karma yoga, that you do everything as a sacrifice. Okay? 
And you can see how in a certain way this becomes sacrificing to the personal God, to Krishna, which to me mystically represents the force or the thing behind everything and not necessarily anything, as, as he says in various scriptures, what people worship here, that is not me. Um, but you can see the extension from the Vedas, which in their own way were the earlier sacrificial elements of making a bargain with the future by the fire ceremony or the offerings, they would they kill the horse ceremonies. They had a lot of different strange sacrificial rites in the Indian tradition. Did they have human sacrifice? I guess the cult of Kali did, you know, but a wide range of like crazy stuff to do, right? But nonetheless, here it evolves, you're still sacrificing, right? But now you're sacrificing the offering of what you're doing to the deity, whatever the form is. So that takes us to this place. So what I did was I, I looked through this quickly and the first thing that I love about this, because remember, this is bhakti. This is Ishvara Pranidhan. This is what Kriya Yoga leads you to. And what I've said, you can do the, po the, you can do the practices as a yoga pra practitioner and go through time. But it takes a long time for the individual to do that. Or you can surrender. And if you surrender, you get it right there and then. So they say, I guess it has to really be a deep enough surrender to warrant that. But they keep referring back to this. Second verse of chapter six. This is the chapter of self-restraint. Got to hold yourself back. What? From continuing to make your ego real. So chapter two, uh, verse two. Because the sannyasi of renunciation is also the yogi of holy work. And no woman can be a yogini who surrenders not her earthly will. All right. So again, they're bringing you to the knees right away. So we're not futzing around here. I'm suffering no fools. Are you in or are you out? And if you want in, give up your shtick. At least that's how I read it. So it's a real confrontation, but you realize how hard this is to do. So he has to keep explaining and amplifying and drawing it out more and more to get you to sweeten the deal. Why wouldn't you want to surrender? Because your ego still wants sovereignty. So, and then... I love this. So you have to change your mind. Verse five, arise therefore, and with the help of thy spirit, lift up thy soul and allow not thy soul to fall. For thy soul can be thy friend and thy soul can be thine enemy. So again, this is a, you know, Buddha said the same thing. There's something about our consciousness that's like a, um, a door that goes in and out. And let's say if it goes out, you see the 10,000 things and you're lost in diversity. But if it swings back in, you can nullify everything and in a certain way, lose yourself or find the, yourself or go beyond the thought of anyone losing or finding this or whatever they say is happening in, in the mode of silence. Not to understand that you become your own enemy because what do you do? You could continue to reinforce the clashes or where they say all the things that out of your own ignorance of the bigger picture and desire to have a sense of I, and be attracted and repelled by different things and the drama that it creates with the karma and then the complete confusion as a result of who you really are since you're disconnected from the source of your own existence. Or as I all this love to say, as JC reminded us, I am the vine and you are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. So yoga is about the connection, uniting, yoking, and the disconnection that happens through your life karma right? Anybody here? Never have to fight back from disconnection and the reconnection. And that's the dance. We're connected. We lose the connection. We reconnect. And it interweaves with everybody else. All right. So then master the inner life and tranquility. See, this is, again, it's putting you on your own. And, you know, it doesn't say you shouldn't be in community. Number eight, when happy with vision and wisdom, she is the master of her own inner life. Her soul set on high, then she is called the yogini in harmony. To her, gold or stones or earth are one. Wow. So something about the equanimity of the inner life. You go beyond the discriminations that value something like dirt versus a stone versus a precious gem. What is a precious gem? Is it precious more than any other rock? Well, so it's something lasts through time. That's beautiful. But other than that, it's just a, it's a judgment. 
a piece of normal stone or shell on the beach is just as unbelievable because it represents the whole cosmos right there. You have to have rich thinking. So inner, inner work. And then of course, verse 10 through 13, where day after day, let the yogini practice in the harmony of soul in a secret place in deep solitude, mistress of her mind, hoping for nothing, desiring nothing. Listen, look at this mindset. I'm going so far inside. I'm pulling myself away from distractions and dependency. We're not saying, remember, you're always going to be interdependent, but dependency on these things to have such strength. And again, the East really values what, what I call this, the, the self introverted mind the introverted mind to self-liberate, the introverted mind to self-liberate. We don't give that much power to introspection in our country. You know? So there's a lot that draws us out rather than pulls us back in. And remember, the rituals that we do are supposed to spin us out, even if only temporary, not to snag us back in. That would be ceremony, then we're, we're just commuting. Let that person find a place that is pure and a seat that is restful, neither too high nor too low, with sacred grass and a skin and a cloth thereon. So again, they're, they're taking the asana, they're teaching you, get your asana together. And something about the sacred grass, whether it's not that's the skin that somehow has some kind of magnetic discharge between your earthy energy that's grounded when you're sitting and somehow the animal skin or the kusa grass or whatever it is that they recommend, who knows if there's some kind of scientific um, disconnect between your electromagnetic field. Does anybody have any fact check on that? No, but they say it all the time, right? And you, all, and you see them when they're meditating, right? They're almost only, always on a skin. What does that mean? They subdued their passions, right? Where they, know, they no longer have to like stalk the world like a, a predator, like the tiger, like, you know, I'm on the top of the chain and you know, and I fear nothing. Like, ah. Subdue the passions, sit on that. Let that be your power seat. You don't have to like pray, pray in the world. Okay, and then of course, on that seat, let her rest and practice yoga for the purifications of the soul, for the life of her body and mind in peace, her soul in silence before the one, with the upright body, head and neck, which rests still and move not, with inner gaze, which is not restless, but rests between the eyebrows, and so forth. You get it? I mean, what are they, what are they pitching here? Sit and meditate and look between the third eye again. And is there historic evidence for this being passed on so this is just the latest reminder, but in the Bhagavad Gita, of course there is. Anyway, 16, 19 to 20 talks about, I love this, your lamp, like a light that's steady for it burns in a shelter where no winds can come. That aspect of your concentration, your ekagrata gets so one pointed it doesn't flicker. And if you tried meditation, you know what I mean by your consciousness flickers and sometimes your consciousness is more focused. So that's their apt metaphor, right? I remember the other one is the tortoise. It's like you have to withdraw your head and your limbs into your shell. You have to go into a temporary cocoon, right? Turn off the, you know, the incoming calls, pull out of the social net, whatever image you want so that I'm not moved as much or at all. How far do you go? I don't know. And then if you're steady in this, 19, when the mind is resting in stillness, by the grace of the spirit, you find fulfillment. Then you know the joy of eternity, a vision seen by reason far beyond what the senses can see. She abides therein and moves not from the truth. Yeah. They're, they're pitching the mystical experience, aren't they? How do you explain? To see by the grace of the spirit. It won't be a theological answer. And then they say, you find joy. Verse 27, thus supreme joy come to the yogini whose heart is still, whose passions are peace, who is pure from sin, who is one with Brahman, one with God. That's why I cause everybody's name ends in Ananda, right? It's supposed to be a blissful experience. Uh, all right. And then the reminder again, the vision of oneness from 30 to 32. So this is like pure mysticism, right? And when she sees me in all, and she sees all in me, then I never leave her and she never leaves me. She who is in this oneness of love, loves me and whatever she sees, whatever this woman may live in truth, this woman lives in me. And she is the greatest yogini. She whose vision is ever one when the pleasure and pain of others 
is her own pleasure and pain. I mean, now you're a Mahatma. <laughs> now you're a grand soul. I mean, look what they're pitching. Right? And then they're finishing off by saying, restlessness will be overcome. I'm not going to read it, but again, restlessness, it's one of the main things in yoga sutras they talk about that, you know, we're restless, we're itchy, we're moving, we're doing, we're parapatetic. We don't know. We're so over hyper vigilant about production and always making something happen. Um, to confuse that with creative spillover and, and certainly not the art of leisure living that allows the sacredness and holiness to come through without having to monetize it in some way. We're overlearned in this. It's hard to stop. It's like a junkie. You withdraw the stimulation. I'm, I'm uncomfortable. So to sit down for a, a short amount of time every day, okay? and then to go even further, to like be willing to be brought into court and have like psych psychotherapists grill you on, you think it's a psychotic ideation to believe that God is real. Because that's what a loaded question that is. Because from spiritual point of view, we all know there's something greater than us. But when you bring it down to that word that's so loaded, like a minefield with so many images, but yet here's, here's the teaching amidst all of that stuff. How do you extract it? This is, you know, I love that word when they call it the Paramahansa. They use that, that phrase for the swan because the swan is supposed to be a creature who can extract water from the milk. Hmm. That they can get the essence of something out of something else and not have it so mushed together that you can't tell the difference. So it represents for them a certain level of discriminative awareness. So some of these things just cannot be explained. But anyway, I love that idea. And it just says, you know, if you're restless, then of course, you're going to strive and end up being born again. And it gives the spiel for that. Then it goes to chapter seven, yoga by discernment, religion by discernment. And again, The first line already is letting you know again, this is all about devotional surrender to some mystical ideal that you cannot really give good evidence for. And the more extraordinary it is that you want people to believe what you think is real, the more extraordinary evidence you'd really need to present, and you can't. Mm -hmm. So I guess you could call this a matter of faith if you want to. But again, it's a feeling. When they talk about ineffability in mystical treatises, it's a feeling. Yes, it can't be corroborated, but it's behind, the, behind a certain point at this level re, by reason. And maybe science will create more neuroanatomy understandings of how our brain and nervous system and chemical composition is capable of generating other dimensions of awareness. But again, that is still somebody existing and we don't want to lose our individuality. One, two. Hear now, Arjuna, how thou shalt have the full vision of me if thy heart is set on me and if striving for yoga, I am thy refuge and supreme, thy refuge supreme. And I will speak to thee of that wisdom and vision which when known, there is nothing else for thee to know. So that's a pretty big statement right there. Um, and I, I've always wondered, um, in an evolving cosmos, is it possible to have a final absolute truth? So how I've tried to reconcile this is, when they're talking about being set on me and striving for yoga, which is the ultimate death of the ego, you could say, death of the personality, and emerging into, these are all choices between mistakes, pure unboundedness, whatever the hell that is. And no matter how much they can just say, it seems to be the loss of the only individuality that you believe is real. You have some kind of credibility in believing your own existence. But they will say that the loss of the thought of that as a separate person and the regaining of this part of yourself that is underlying this all, which you could call it nirvana, the complete unconditioned existence. So you can't say anything about it because it's beyond, but that's the only life that actually does exist, has always only existed. 
And it was only temporarily through our ignorance of that fact that we got lost in this drama, if you buy that. And that's what they're selling. And every seller needs a buyer. Um, but again, you know, I like to say this because I'm comfortable going in and out of the theological stuff like that and the religious stuff and not getting caught by it. So I think it says that when, once the prayer goes through the roof of the mosque or the church or the temple or whatever the sacred structure is, God can't tell what denomination it came from anymore because God only buys from wholesalers, not retailers. <laughs> Haven't heard that one for a long time. So, you know, there are a lot of strains within yoga that are all like retail, you know, <laughs> that's fine. So the whole universe is, <laughs> so verses seven through 12 just goes on like a, you know, a wonderful self-congratulatory power trip about like, I'm everything. Don't you get it? The whole universe is me, the cosmos, the planets, the elements, the power of the strong. It's a, it's a beautiful expression of letting, you know, Whatever you can think of, that's me and I'm beyond that. And the, every, anything you can't even think of, I'm that too and beyond that. It's a powerful tour de force. But it leads you to understanding there are different, once you get that, the spirit recognizes that people seek the spirit in different ways. Just like we said, there were four different yogas. So this is a beautiful verse when they get to um, 17, uh, 16 to 19. There are four kinds of women who are good. And the four love me, Arjun, the woman of sorrows, the seeker of knowledge, the seeker of something she treasures, and the woman of vision. The greatest of these is the woman of vision, who is ever one and who loves the one. For I love the woman of vision, and the woman of vision loves me. There are four kinds of women are good, but the woman of vision and I are one. Her whole soul is one in me. And I am her path supreme. And then here comes the reincarnation tip. At the end of many lives, the woman of vision comes to me. God is all, this great woman says. Such a spirit sublime, how rarely is she found. And then, this is a great recognition of the idea of the spirit commenting on from a point of the absolute beyond and above everything, beyond name and form, beyond shape and substance, it can recognize that different worshipers because of where they're coming from, devote themselves to different kinds of deities and they get what those deities promise. But do you wanna see that metaphorically or like literally there are beings in other dimensions like the Deva Lokas and stuff like that. If you wanna indulge in like your own inner Marvel fantasy, you know, comic, you know, it's not the deities of, no, of the Norse tradition in Asgard. You know, it's the deities of like, you know, Shangri-La or like, you know, or whatever. If a woman desires, this, verse 21, if a woman desires with faith to adore this or that God, I give faith unto that woman, a faith that is firm moves not. And when this woman full of faith goes and adores that God or that God is from him or her, she attains her desires. But whatever is good comes from me. But these are women of little wisdom, and the good they want has an end. Those who love the gods go to the gods, but those who love me come unto me. Who is this talking? If it's not the gods, it's some god on a trip, right? Like, but isn't it any different than Yahweh say, have no other gods before me? So what is, the, is this, this dogmatism? Is this exclusivity? I think, are we just projecting the metaphoric idea of some invisible thing behind it that's free from that, but somehow intervenes in history in different ways? So this is the Ishvara Pranidhan, this is the surrender, verse 29. For those who take refuge in me and strive to be free from age and death, they know Brahman, they know Atman, and they know what karma is. So he sets him up by saying that and saying, all right, right away, the next chapter, he begins, Brahman, Atman, Karma, come on, you know, I'm a Kshatriya. I just know about weapons and you know, keeping the boundaries and court intrigue and following orders and stuff like that. What are you talking about? And now Krishna is going to tell him. Now, this is another great idea behind the whole yoga system 
and the beautiful tapestry it's trying to weave. In verse five, and she who at the end of her time leaves her body thinking of me, she in truth comes to my being, she in truth comes unto me. For on whomsoever one thinks at the last moment of life, unto her in truth she goes through sympathy with her nature. Wow. You get that? Because they believe in reincarnation. It's not just the general tendency of how your life was, but the momentum exactly at the moment when you croak is supposed to be, that's it, that's, the, that's going to imprint something that's going to condition the next bardo state or something like that. Now you may think that, what, who can do that? Because it says, you got to remember, next one, think of me therefore at all times, remember me and fight. Fight what? Fight the loss of this awareness of being distracted back into the ego thing. Because in a certain moment you're gonna die and if you die with, the, with a weird thought in your head, you're gonna be a roach or something like that. So I love this. And with mind and reason on me, thou shalt in truth come to me. Now, this is an apocryphal story, but I think there's evidence for this because I've heard more than one source. To show you how modern day yogis, or at least somebody, at least one example, takes this so much to heart Mahatma Gandhi, his deity was Ram. And he had pages and pages when he would not be, you know, doing his thing on marching or, or making cotton, whatever. He would sit in his book and just write Ram, 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 Ram. And then when he got assassinated, at the moment that he got shot, he didn't say, unite India and Pakistan, you know, or like, you know, tell my wife I love her. Say, Don't forget to do my count. No. The second he got shot, Ram. I guess some guys are really into it. Anyway, the final thought at death. And again, they said it in the, in the last one about your, your, your yoga seat. And he repeats again in number 10. With a mind that winders not. Keep the power of her life between her eyebrows. And she goes to that supreme spirit, the supreme spirit of light. Drishti here. It's in the yoga sutras of what happens also. It's one of the samyama points that you go into samadhi by focusing on the third eye and everything you need to know about light and its relationship to the planets. Right. You got to review what they, what they say happens when you get there. Pretty interesting. So again, meditate on the third eye, right? It's repeated in, in, in the sutras, right? You meditate on your guru, you meditate on the third eye, you chant Om, or you stop the breath after the exhale and do a Bayakumbaka, the four ways to get into Samadhi quickly if you can't surrender. But you gotta practice those things to get good at it, right? Because the mature articulation, which means your own experience would then starts developing your own intelligence, right? How, how many times have you heard me say at some point, you have to stop reading other people's ideas and work the field for yourself. So the path with no railings. Yes, you may have teachers or other people you can talk to about it, but at a certain point, it's really about you and what works for you in your body and the constant change, right? You wanna keep it constant, but there's change all the way. That's the only constancy. How do you keep adapting to your body type and your age and financial situations and living conditions and the amount of stresses on your plate and so forth? So they're telling you, focus up here. And then this 12th verse, if when a woman leaves her earthly body, she is in the silence of yoga and closing the doors of the soul, she keeps the mind in her heart and places in the head the breath of life and remembering me, she utters Om, the eternal word of Brahman. She goes to the path supreme. So, you know, they have their own tautological arguments. They keep coming back again and again to things that they want to remind you of because there's so much to take in. And again, to, to buy their shtick, as you remember, you have to realize it's asking you to see through or disillusion yourself. But no one wants to be disillusioned because we don't have the stomach to admit, I've been living under illusion this time. It's so hard to take. Or am I all, all alone here? Is it just hard for me to take? I don't want my, my apple cart upset. I want my status quo to be at least as good as it is now, maybe even better. Nothing should change that. Okay. Anywho, 
<laughs> so once again, they say this is a long path. Check this out. The Knights of Brahman, 18, 16 to 18. So now this is steeping into their mysticism. Just try to tell me what you think about this. For all worlds pass away, even the world of Brahma, the creator. They pass away and return. But she who comes unto me goes no more from death to death. This is the salvation doctrine. They're trying to tell you that the greatest fear you have, Abhinavesha, clinging to life and fear of death. Yoga has an answer. But remember, it's a long path. And the Yana yogis say metaphysical knowledge is the same thing as Ishvara Pranidhan. So surrender. They who know that vast day of Brahma, the God of creation, ever lasts a thousand ages. And that his night also lasts a thousand ages. They know in truth day and night. And that when that day comes, all visible creation arises from the invisible. And all creation disappears into the invisible when the night of darkness comes. It's like the string theory in, uh, in quantum mechanics. Like, you know, periodically there's the Big Bang and then the dissolution. Right? Thus, the infinity of beings which live again and again all powerlessly disappear when the night of darkness comes, like the supernova explosion bursts our planet to bits, to smithereens, the ultimate death star. And they all return again at the rising of the day. <clears throat> But beyond this creation, visible and invisible, there is an invisible. Beyond this creation, there is an invisible, higher, eternal. And when all things pass away, this remains forever and ever. The invisible is called the everlasting and is the highest and supreme. Those who reach the invisible never return. This is my abode supreme. So they keep pitching this whole thing. It's, a, it's to be united in devotion to Krishna and offer all your works, going backward. Discern everything is God, right? Everything is God. I know we're lost in, in the apparent illusion of things being separate from one another, and they do have some kind of subjective differentiation, but they're all hung on the, on the loom of something that's the glue that we can't see because the optical delusion of separateness is so strong. And the unraveling of our own individuality back into the state of devotion. Um, these are the tips that I'm getting from this system. But of course, I'm perverting it or interpreting it in my own way because I'm a yoga provocateur. And so I said, I hate dogma and I will not listen to any fundamentalist view in any system. And yet it didn't stop me from both staying with a system for a very long time and critiquing the system at the same time Right? But again, it's not limited to yoga. You've, I heard, hope you've heard me say that after I studied the lesson with the rabbi and I, I tell him the good things, so I, I see I got it, I repeat it good, I understand it right, he says, okay, now give me the critique. You have to have the dialectic. You have to be able to see the other side. And especially going forward, there's a lot of people who need to be healed by being listened to and other people who we don't listen to that we have to learn to listen to. You know, like to give respect, get respect. And it's very, very difficult in, uh, in a time where um, negotiation and civility and other aspects of what we know is proper communication, not just human communication, but what I would call dharmic communication, where there's that extra effort we assume to, to give the better one, to take the high road or whatever, or since sometimes forceful action is necessary, be as clear as we can when a, when a strong action has to be expressed to another person. But, but until that moment, as I say, as kind as we can, say it in the kindest way possible, say the kindest things in the kindest way possible. So that's where we are. Now this class began supposedly at 12.30, is that correct? Quick. I'm going to share my screen. So I'm going to leave you for a second. So I've gotten much better at, at manipulating my finger control. And now I'm just going to get rid of the present. Thing. There we go. 
All right, so you see my chief and nothing else, yes? Yes. Oh, good, good. Boy, I'm so proud of myself. I really am. I'm going to put a gold star in the refrigerator. And then when I walk in, I'm going to say, good boy. Give him, give him a treat. Give that boy a treat. What he did, he's so good. Why do people talk like that when they talk to their dog? Isn't that weird? Because dogs are like little kids. It is. I think it's wonderful uh -huh. that, that it appeals to that part of ourselves. All right. So this is uh, Chief Seattle. And uh, you know, one of my favorite one-liners here. Right? We didn't invent the web, web of life. We're merely a, a strand in it. Anything we do to the web, we do to ourselves. Hmm. Uh, you know, ecology wasn't a word <laughs> when he was talking about this. It's the natural respect that you have for the earth mother, as they would say. And so all myth, as you know, is supposed to be connected to a geographical location in the old days when people had bounded horizons, more or less. But history is the increasing breaking of boundaries. And now the mother earth we're talking about literally is the whole planet and not just a piece of ground that a given culture or nation seems to be occupying. Anything we do to it, we do to ourselves. All right, so. Now, one of the things that I've learned from Joseph Campbell is one of my mentors is not just follow your bliss, which means don't do anything that's not, that doesn't have your heart in it. You know, stop doing things that deaden your soul because every place is sacred. His scholarship made us understand how human beings all over the world recognize a sacredness to life before we organize it. Remember, I'm a big critic of, you know, Ram Dass used to say, God says, I'll create truth. And the devil says, good, I'll organize it. Or Carl Jung has a phrase that says, religion is a way of preventing a religious experience. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mute yourself. People don't want to know. Okay. Anyway, I'm glad you like that one. So follow your bliss doesn't just mean like walking around with a, a, a grin on your face and like, you know, being devil may care again, uncon cheerfully unconcerned about the future. No, not, we're not saying that. You know, there's a, there's a, he, he always quotes this um, thing from the early 1900s when there was so much change going on. T.S. Eliot coined this phrase, the wasteland. And he took it from an Arthurian legend from the F Fisher King, where like when the, when the king is wounded, the land goes desolate and doesn't produ produce milk and honey. And when people live lives of quiet desperation, meaning they're not really following their bliss, right? He was saying literature at the time can sometimes, and you know, always show something more true than fiction, uh, uh, you know, nonfiction. That the fictional can show truth in a way that sometimes the non-fictional can't. And so he was saying there was a story in, in, in Babbitt that he read about a guy who was like living a life of quiet desperation. And Joseph Campbell said he once went to a, a diner to, to eat and a family came in there and the boy was fidgeting around and, and the father was saying, you know, stop doing that, sit there like that. And, and the mother says to the father, don't tell him what to do. You can't tell him what to do. And he says, what do you mean I can't tell him what to do? I've been told what to do my whole life and I've never done a thing I've wanted to do in my whole life. And then Joseph Campbell got the realization, there it is, there it is. The person realizing that they're just walking to somebody else's tune. They're like a little marionette and the strings are being pulled and they, they go along like a doll, right? But the idea is to nurture your creative imagination. Creative incubation. You have to find some way of bringing something forth. Remember, art is making something. Didn't I say that? Yoga is an art form. It's something you make. And then what do you practice? That's part of what you make. And that's what enables you to bring forth who you are and bring forth what you have within you. And you can say in a certain way that is giving birth. You, know, you become a midwife to yourself. Now you have to go against the fact that most action is socially and economically determined. And that's back to the Babbitt. You're just doing what's been requested of you by your culture. It would be terrible to think you never did a thing in your life that you really wanted to do. But it keeps coming back to the vision that this particular image gives us. And of course, this subverts 
what I would call the yoga story because it changes the direction of your dharma. Look at what you're pursuing. So, how do you get the wow feeling? Go find a place to do it and get it done. I like to bring this up because for me, flamenco dancing just imbues me with a duende right from my heels, right up to my, my spirit. And I love it. It has beautiful expressions, both in, in men and women, both as dancers, as singers, as instrumentalists. It's just one example of recognizing what I call getting the, get the wow feeling. And it's always done in a location. Find the place to do it in and then get her done, son. No excuses. Just go out there and live it. All right, so a few more minutes, quickly go through this. The storytellers remind us <clears throat> that the human psyche is the inward aspect of the body. That's the psyche, right? The human aspect. It takes you into the world of imagination. You die to the flesh. You're reborn to the spirit as the conscious life of which your body is the vehicle. And now you identify with that of which your vehicle is the carrier. It's free. You, you've unleashed, you've resurrected something that had to be crucified in your life. And I love this image because if you get the gospel story, she couldn't believe it was an apparition. He said, feel my hands, right? So I don't know what kind of transubstantiation as an ascended master he might have been able to pulled off to like rematerialize in the physical vehicle. But it's a great metaphysical truth. So look for art in your life. Art is always showing you the radiance. Another great image. You can take it to the gospel story or you can be understand what it is to be led by the star when you wish upon a star it makes no difference who you are your dreams come true now sacrifice gruesome as it has been <laughs> through history right there's other kinds of sacrifices rather than just like killing each other this way you know you can first make a metaphysical breakthrough that your life and your willingness to risk your life to save somebody else is a breakthrough of realization that you're ultimately one. And what I think of as spiritual concepts are to put you in touch with this fact. And that puts you in touch with the fact that you are alive. And so are the other, this, this other person. And then of course, for me, the image of recognizing the unity of all things at once arises the question, how can we support this life of ours with least injury, ahimsa, to the lives around us, and how can we prevent our own life adding to the suffering of the world in which we live? Well, you gotta work on yourself. And then maybe you'll have a revelation. You can walk around the, the bush and all of a sudden, oh, take off your sandals. No, you're on holy ground. Oh, it could happen, as Judy Tenuta would say, it could happen. But metaphorically, what does it mean? In the blink of an eye, it communicates to you, and now you're on a mission unworthy as you may feel you are. And then you've made the marriage, not just with another person, but with the divine beloved. You sacrificed the relationship, not just to each other. And you know, it's not just a love affair, it's an ordeal. But you and God are the majority, you and spirit are the majority. So remember, they're gonna load you up in your camel and fill you with knowledge. You gotta be a lion to take all that knowledge and be self-confident as you go into the world and meet the dragon in which you have to kill and take away every scale on the dragon that says thou shalt and thou shalt not. And if you can do that, you will become a wheel rolling under your own initiative. And living fearlessly to educate yourself and other people without any fear of death. Because she has put aside the passing moment of terror with people threatening her life. And she 
requires us all to live this way. The wheel of life rolls. You're on top, you're on the way down, you're all the way down, you're on the way up. Where are you today? And just remember, no one can tell you where it is. You have to recognize it for yourself. So I thank you, sir, for reminding me to be strict in my critique of how I do the craft, but continue to aspire to the ideal. And if you do that, everyone, you will be helped by hidden hands. Doors will open where you thought there were none, or there were none for other people, but not for you. All right, so that's where we are. And now we're going to go into the part where I always like to say with my teacher saying, you're all smoking a fire. Why are you not teaching them poses? You're just giving them words. But I hope that I said one or two one-liners there, like free therapy for you. I even heard a laugh there at one point, which is really great. Um, keep it light. And now we're going to have a asana class that's going to help in a lot of ways. What is it gonna help? It's gonna help self-restraint. It's gonna help discernment. And it's gonna help devotion. So love yourself, be kind to yourself, and be honest about your frontiers. So are we, I'm, I'm, am I gonna, I'm gonna spotlight Patty? Yes. Can you right. do that? Yeah. You now spotlighted her, right? Not pin, spot. Yeah, spotlight. Right, exactly. Now, I just want to make sure, if I go to gallery view, can you still see Patty, Patty spotlighted? Yes, I, we see Patty spotlighted. That's excellent, because that way I can continue to holler at everybody. Great. All right. So you see Patty and I, are, we're wearing our matching black and blue, but we're, we're not, psychologically, we're not trying to tell you that you're going to get black and blue as of doing that. No, no, it's, that, that's not the message. All right, so... Um, Robert, Alyssa, and phone with no name. If I'm assuming that you're choosing to keep your screen dark, which is fine. Um, but if you want me to see your poses and give you feedback, um, I'd appreciate if you uh, turn on your camera. Uh, okay. Meg, I can't see the lower part of you. So you got to change your camera, whatever. And um, otherwise, that's good. Yeah, Judy, hi. Good to see you. Um, so uh, we're starting off with Tadasana. And have a, have a belt for yourself. And let's just review something with Patty as she's going to show you what's going on here. Okay? Um, so first, I want you to put the belt underneath your feet. Right in the middle of your arch. And then extend your arms to full extension first. Then bend your knees a little bit and wrap your hand around the belt one time. And then simultaneously straighten your legs and pull up on the belt strongly and feel the lift that you're getting in this version of Tarasana. Okay. So now relax the belt. And now you got to do it again because now that you know something's going to happen, pay more attention to what actually is happening. So when you do what you do, be aware of what did I just do? And where do you feel it in your body? Because then a third time, we're going to do it without the belt. And your job will be to energize without the help of the belt, what the help, belt is helping you to do right now. All right. So again, bend the knees, wrap the hands, and now pull up one more time. Chest is lifting, legs strong, squeeze the outside of the thighs in toward each other. Let the inner thigh move straight back. Keep your chin level. Good. And notice the upward extension that you're getting. Remember, the bottom of your spine on the back of your body moves up from bottom to top. The skin on the upper back moves down. Back spine moves up from bottom to top. Upper back skin moves down from top to bottom. Okay, let go of the belt. And now, relax for a second. So now you know what the, uh, the action is. You felt it to some extent. All right, so now, hands to your side once again. Lengthen up and see what you can do. 
What did the belt teach you about how to get the lift? Welcome back. Yeah. Outer thighs squeezing in, inner thighs moving back. All right. Now, I want you to get more of a feeling of lifting out of the pelvic basin. So here's how we're going to do this technique. Let's watch Patty for a second. Patty, get a block, please. So we're going to simply do Urdhva Hastasan, but we're going to use the block to give us a different contact sensation. So Patty's going to place the block vertically above the knee and see there's a space between the top of the block and her perineal floor. Exactly. And then because of her leg shape, she's going to move her feet and outer calves in even a nano inch to get straight and straighter line. Exactly. Now she's going to show you that she could roll her thighs from the outside in toward the midline. Exactly. She could roll the pelvic rims from outside in, narrowing. And then she's going to show you she can go to the back and she can roll the back of where her buttock muscles meet the ischial tuberosities from inside out that way. It's the same internal rotation, but now it's coming from the back of the body. Huh? Yeah. So come on back here again. Great. So now it's easy to turn the lateral thigh toward the block and it's easy to move the inner thigh back. It's not so easy to roll that outer hamstring where it laterally meets the outer thigh around, but that's what you got to do. All right now she's also going to raise her arms into Urdhva Hastasan and not lose the leg work. And then we'll give you a couple of tips while you're here. All right. So everybody get your block and do it. All right. Squeeze it in. Good. Keep your chin up. Now, if your arms are not going behind your head, bring your arms back down. And Patty, make sure there's room behind you. You're going to start off not by taking your arms straight, but by bending your elbows, bring your hands by the side of your head like you're combing your hair and go all the way back till your fingers touch. Keep lifting the elbows vertically up higher and higher all the way back. And once you get your elbow vertical, then stretch your arm up and then you'll see that your arm goes behind your head, right? So like you're combing your hair, go all the way back. Once the elbows get vertical, the palm can touch, fingertips can touch, then stretch the arms up from there and really give yourself that sense that your biceps are behind your ears. Yeah. Chin up, chin up, and breathe. Now, did you lose the action in your legs? All right. Now, from here, bring your arms back down. Now, don't lose the leg work. Now, put your awareness in the space just above the block and below the bottom of your perineum and lift that space up alone. Now add everything else that you learned about the posture before, squeezing the thighs in, rolling them from outside in, using the back thigh muscles to spin from inside out. And notice the moment you drop the height of the perineum, how the whole spine will lose its upward lift. See now, drop the height of the perineum. Everybody see the collapse? Very good, all right. Supta Urdhva Hastasan. Watch Patty. She's going to show you again how to set this up. Have a block, if you have one, and a belt. <clears throat> so you're going to loop your belt to be wide enough for your wrists. And you're going to use the block to grip between your inner legs. All right, so once you get set, tuck your tush, use your arms to help break your fall. Good. Elongate the back of your body. Grip the block with your legs. Lengthen through your heels. Yeah, now use your, use your hands. Wait, before you do the belt, use your hands to turn your thighs more inward than you thought. Use your thumbs to pull that hamstring, again, laterally and around. And then elongate through your legs. Exactly. Now, maintain. Don't lose that. Put your hands in the belt. 
and raise your hands first so you're directly above your shoulders. Now, we're going to do the hands in two different positions. Make sure that the belt clears your wrist bone. So it's just shy of the carpal bone on the lowest end, which now is the distal end of your forearm, your ulna, and your radius. Good. Now, burst the belt apart and drop the shoulders down. That's right. Remember, the skin of the upper back pulls down from top to bottom. Now, as you burst the belt, slowly take the arm behind you, leading with your thumb, and notice that when the palms face each other, it's the side body that gets more of a stretch. So perceive that as you stretch. If you have difficulty getting your hands to the floor, put a bolster or a couple of blankets underneath so your, your shoulders don't have to strain, and continue to pull the shoulders down and rotate the upper arm externally. Roll it away from your neck. All right, bursting the belt, keeping the action in your legs. Slowly bring your hands back to where they were. Stop when they're directly over the shoulders, fingers pointing toward the ceiling. All right, now from here, turn your palms to face away from you. So your knuckles face you and your palms are facing your feet. That's right, just a shorter belt, Meg. Now, when the palms are facing forward, the front of the body gets more of a stretch than when the palms are facing inwards where the side body gets a stretch. See if that's what you perceive. Dropping the shoulders down, moving the skin from top to bottom. Exhale, slowly burst the belt, go over in stages. Discern whether or not one side moves the same as the other. The further the arms go back, the mind is attracted to the motion. Don't forget the action of the legs gripping in with the thighs, pressing the inner thighs down to the floor, stretching through the heels, and discerning the difference between how one side is moving and the other side is moving. Now, when the arms start to come up, don't lose the awareness in the legs. Dropping the shoulders down, bursting the belt out. Inhale, exhale, slowly start raising the arms up, breathe as is necessary. Smooth move. And then slowly bring the arms out and down. Okay, so now um, I want you to watch Patty first before um, you do this. So come on up and she's gonna show you now soup to pot of one with a small variation. Gabriel, can you see me okay? Yes, I can. So we're gonna do it twice. But the first time we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it and we're gonna give you a handicap, so to speak. We're going to bend the left leg at the knee and have the foot on the floor. So the whole first variation is to show you how much the left leg is really active in the pose and how it not being active inhibits the movement of the right leg. So we get the left leg out of the way by bending the knee, which disengages the hamstring, right? Because when you stretch your leg, or you could say when you extend your knee, it's the hamstring muscle that has to stretch to do that as the quadricep contracts. So she keeps the left leg where it is, she bends the right knee into her chest, and she lassos the foot. And then the first time she does this, she stretches her leg up, but she's gonna stretch her arms in a different position. Instead of starting, notice with her hands on the outside and the thumb holding it between the thumb and the index finger, she's gonna turn her hand a little bit, so she's grasping now from underneath it, and then when she stretches her arms over her head, it enables her to have a V shape with her arms. So she starts to let out the slack of her belt. And obviously, if you have a short belt, there'll be a limit how far you can go, as if she wants to take her arms to the floor behind her. Yes. And she has the belt on the ball mount of the foot. Now, as you pull towards yourself, most students know the back of the leg, the hamstring seems to feel the stretch. But what she's going to do is she's going to say, no, that's an uneven action. I'm going to stretch the front of my leg, the quadricep and the shin away from me with the same intensity that the back of the leg is pulling toward me. And then she's going to do the same thing, but she's going to put the belt by the heel of her foot and not the ball mount of her foot. 
and you have to accurately get it on the heel so that the angle when you pull your arms over your head doesn't cause the belt to slide. And then you do the same arm action, shoulders always dropping. And now she gets a little bit more power. But once again, the back of the leg is gonna fudge it a little bit. So she has to stretch the front of her leg even more right there. You got it? So that's gonna be the first time we'll do it through both sides and then we'll repeat the whole thing, except that the second time we'll extend the other leg out on the floor. Got it? Come on, let's do it. Soup to pot of one. Nice, Patty. All right, so start on your back, bent leg, left leg, heel come close to your buttock. Then lasso the foot with your hand and inhale, exhale, stretch your leg up. Have the belt around the ball mount of the foot just where it meets the arch. Then have your hands coming from underneath it. So the th thumb loops on the inside, the fingers on the outside. And then if you stretch your arms over your head and let's slack out of the belt. Come on, Heidi, let's slack out. Stop, there you go. Drop the shoulders down as you do that. And now active back leg. So take a few breaths. Feel what it's like. So Robert, you gotta take your arms over your head. I, I can't see the second hand. No, it's cause the camera, I can't see in the second hand. That's all right. All right, so use your breath. Now remember, you might think that the back of the leg is straight, but you can't see, assume it is not. So press the front of your leg, the quadricep muscle from your pelvic rim to the top kneecap and your shin bone from just below the kneecap to where the ankles are away from you. Match the intensity. So this is discernment. You should know one stretches more, one stretches less. One is overdoing, one is underdoing, find out. All right, and breathing, relax always. Don't go apoplectic in your face. All right, very good. So don't break stride, just inhale, exhale, switch the belt to the heel side. And go right into it. You don't need permission. So hold at a steady point. So Judith, can you get the belt more on your heel and less on your arch? Meg, you too. Same thing, Robert. Lose your breath. Remember, prana and chitta for the, for the students who've been around a long time. You have to add awareness of your breath as part of the whole mastering of the asana process. And chitta, what mindset is being brought up as a result of this? All right, good. Inhale, exhale, my friends, that's enough. Down you go, bend that leg, knee to the floor, take a couple of breaths, flow and glow, flow and glow, enjoy what you did. All right, and then uh, set up the second side. All right, start off on the ball mount. And again, the shape of your feet are different. So if you're really honest with yourself, you may find that the placement is slightly different because the shape of the feet are not the same. Nonetheless, do soft, easy breathing. Remember, hold a steady state. Only three things can happen. You play your edge, which means you find the point at which if you go any further, it starts giving you uncomfortable feedback. So you back off and you wait there. That's your edge. And only three things happen. Nothing happens, so you stay the same and you breathe. Elasticity happens. I call it slippage. The muscle gives way to the next level, not because your ego wanted it to happen, because it just did it by itself, and you take up the slack and go deeper, or the intensity starts getting too much, even though a moment ago it was fine, and you back off but you don't come out of the pose. All right, now inhale, exhale from here, get the heel, do a better job than the first time. And once you have the arms giving you the leverage to pull the leg back, assume that the back of the knee is bent. So you have to resist the front of your leg away from you more while maintaining whatever Median line understanding you have. Where's the plumb line of the pose? Is the inner edge of your left thigh and the inner edge of your right thigh 
just directly in line with the midline of the navel or not? All right, so continue to breathe, continue to breathe. All right, inhale, exhale, and slowly come on out of that. Bend the leg, stay there, take a breath, flow and glow. Oh, feels so nice, doesn't it? All right, so now, that's why they call me the kind and compassionate one, because I let people practice with that other bent leg. Now I'm not gonna be so nice in your estimation. And just as a matter of thing, Laurie, don't forget, have the student put the calves on the chair. So instead of it just being the knee bent, have the shin up because that tilts the pelvis even more. They get even a better flexion in the hip. Yeah, like that. So on, resting on a chair while they do the other leg up in the air. Even more so. Okay, so now get that other leg out, get that left leg straight. Stretch the right leg as well. Wait, 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 wait. You got, you're jumping ahead, come on. Stretch the right leg out. No, no, come on. Both legs out. Soup the, soup the tadasan first. Good, now grip the legs, squeeze them in. Hips squeeze, knees squeeze, ankle squeeze, legs long. Now listen, when you bend your leg, your right leg, your left leg is not gonna wanna stay on the ground doing what it's doing. Before you just jump to the pose willy nilly, you weren't paying any attention. So activate your legs and notice at what point the left leg has to really start struggling now. It's not a gimme anymore. So you're gonna bend the right knee first and then you'll see before you stretch your right leg up. Good, so bend the right knee, inhale, keep that left leg working. And now losing the left leg as little as possible, hook the belt and repeat. Keep challenging your left leg the whole time. The real action in the pose is the left leg. My students have heard me say this from Mr. Anger many, many times. The leg that's on the floor is the action in the pose. The leg that you're pulling toward you is only the motion of the pose. And the action begins after the motion ends. So you press your left leg down, you turn your left leg in, you thrust your whole left leg away from the waistline through the heel, and you maintain while your mind goes to another part of your body. And now again, assume that the back of your leg is bent. So resist the front of your leg stronger until you feel evenness between the two. Again, practice discernment. and restrain yourself from pulling the leg toward you unless it has a counter stretch. Prati Praksha Bhavanam, current of energy going one way, counter current going the other way. All right, grab the heel and finish it off. So, what did changing the angle of inclination by holding the heel do to the left leg? And remember, the closer the thigh bone of the raised leg comes towards your hip socket, the more likely it is to shorten or narrow the outer lateral hip as it goes to the outer corners of your waistline and then goes up to the lumbar. So roll your left hip socket circularly away from your waistline toward your inner right heel while pulling the thigh toward yourself and ground the thigh in the hip socket. All right, inhale, exhale, bend the leg, slowly come down, keep your left leg working, join it to the other leg and re-energize both. See whether or not the right leg is gonna do as good a job as the left. Inhale, exhale, gripping that right leg, bend the left leg, pause, re-energize the right leg, because again, it's the same dance. You connected it, it disconnected, you gotta reconnect it. All right, now other side, come on up. Working the right leg the whole time the left leg goes straight. So study, one side naturally does better. Nature helps one side, you have to help the other. So you have to figure out what it is, in which, which position. Keep the inner, inner legs close to the midline. So that just like he was saying, sitting with your head and neck direct and torso, same thing, crown of your head, tip of your nose, juggle your notch, space between the breasts, belly button, rectum genitals. There's the midline, find the plumb line. God is the median plane. Are you dropping those shoulder muscles off your neck? 
as the arms come over, if your shoulders are tight, your rib cage will poke up. Suck the lateral ribs back down to the floor. All right, switch to the heel and breathe as you do. Now, here's the thing for everyone to try, but I think only the students who have put more time in will this make any sense whatsoever. Most of the time when you're stretching your hamstring muscle, let's think about our raised leg muscle now, you only think of it as kind of a vertical band. But when we did Tadasana, remember we, we stretched the inner upper thigh laterally. So now you don't have your fingers. Can you spread the back of your left thigh wide? So visualize where's the middle of the back of your left thigh. If you could spread it wide, so one side goes to one side and one side goes to the other, like you're opening it like an accordion from the center out to the sides. Now do that on the leg that's on the floor. Don't just press it down and lengthen it, widen it. And hopefully a little cue like that sharpens the pose a little bit. So inhale, exhale, and slowly come on out. Very nice. You did good. You did good. All right. Come on up. It's, it's time for me to like share the bad news. You know, my, my name is Gabriel. My Hebrew name is Gavriel. It means the messenger. And the messenger all, isn't always about the annunciation. <laughs> he did come to Mary, but he's also the one who blows the trumpet of revelation at the end of times. So there's, an, there's another message there too. But anyway. Supta Virasan is such a hard pose for so many students to do. And when I say the old days, when I first began practicing and there was listing of poses according to intro poses, level one poses, level two poses, and so on. The fact that people couldn't sit between their knees let alone go back into Supdivarasan. And you guys can be preparing as I'm saying this. There's no way to waste time. Notice what Patty is doing though, because we're going to show you for the super stiff. Lori can go right into it. It's fine. But you have to build up for so many people. It becomes a nightmare. My feet hurt. My shins hurt. My knees hurt. My low back hurts especially. And yet it's one of the main poses that they tell you to do. So can you see what Patty has done? Step away from the chair once again, Patty. She's first created the chair against the wall, so hopefully it doesn't move, or she has a block to sit down on so she doesn't have to get all the way to the floor. She positions it far enough away from the chair that when she puts the bolster behind her, as you'll see in a second, it's going to kind of be a diagonal support. She's gonna lift it off the floor eventually because she's gonna be able to wedge it in. So she sits back. She makes sure that the height is enough that it's not hurting her knees. And then she holds, she's close enough that when she leans back into it, she can lift the bolster and wedge it against the chair. Yes. And if she does it high enough, her head can get supported. If she's short, she can put a blanket in her head and then she can relax her arms either on her stomach or she can do the elbow frame and stretch over her head. Exactly, like that. Now, if you can do the bolster, do that. Now, if you don't have a bolster, then she's gonna show you how to do it so the chair basically hits your shoulder blade and you put a block on the chair as a support for your head. Can you turn to the side so someone can see that? Exactly. So that way, she still can get some support from the chair. And then if she doesn't have a bolster, she can use a block or something to support her head and take it back to extension. Is, on, is that on its highest height, right? Yeah. yeah. So again, she might have a block. You have to find out what's the amount of extension that doesn't put your neck, in, neck into any extreme stretch. All right. So everybody, find your way to hang out and I'll give you the story about this. So it's really important. So because Virasan wasn't coming. 
we were learning that in sequencing the exercises properly, that it's not that you can't give a variation, but the variation implies that you already have some foundation in the base pose. So supta virasan is a variation of virasana. And just as I wouldn't teach somebody headstand and variations before I taught them headstand, I realized, okay, I hear what he's saying. And so many students then couldn't do supta virasana, and we have plenty of props to help them do it. But then came the slam. He says, if you don't practice supta virasana, you do not have an asana practice. He said, but what if I'm doing all the other poses? But again, stop trying to justify your own version of what yoga is with what is the master trying to tell you? It's the very attempt to make any headway in virasan, and then however you have to modify supta virasan, continue to include it in your basic program. It should be part of your daily practice because it helps so many other parts of your anatomy. And for the women out there who studied with me, you know that in the early days when we would teach asana for women in their menstruating cycle, what were the first three poses we made everybody do? Supta Bhattakanasana with support, Supta Vrasana with support, Supta Padmasana with support. The chest is supposedly in the same position relative to the supports, but the legs change the way the pelvis, the groin, the ankles feel. So they really sell it like snake oil. So again, find some way to do Supta Vrasana because of all the benefits. If you saw the kind of Willis Tower I have to build to get any kind of like minimal backbend, you'd say, okay, if this guy can like, you know, do this, I'm not gonna think that I'm too far off. I'll find some way to lean back a little bit. And remember, as we all age, and we are all aging, as we all age, gravity works to topple the front of the body, and especially for women, Kyphosis or mineral bone loss tends to make the upper back a little bit more rounded. And we can prevent it from going into that dowager's hump by extension. Even if you sat on your knees and did a really bad ustrasan, you know, just put belts on these shins, hold them with your hands and pull up without even bending back anything to keep open the front body. And then of course, tremendous digestive awareness, right? All these poses that help you awaken what I call jatar agni, the fire of the stomach that burns the food and creates heat in the body, which as we know has some connection to the kundalini energy, the awakening of body heat. Very mystical. All right, take three long, slow, deep breaths together as a group. Inhale and exhale. That's good. Inhale and exhale. Don't be in a rush. Inhale and exhale. Very good. When you come up, put your palms to your heels, puff the chest, increase the back bend, head follows the chest if you can. Ugh. So do you see how you came up, Heidi, with one arm and then the other arm? So go back down again, puffing your chest. Everybody else can come out and start to do child's pose. So scoot your hands closer to your heel and bend the elbow on the floor already, good. Now press down with your hands on the heels Use your elbows as leverage and come up. Head back more. Head back more. Puff the chest more. Puff. Yeah, there you go. And follow. There you go. So find a little interim. You may have like have to have stop at one point, regroup, and go up again. All right. So child's pose, everybody. Touch the toes together, knees apart, stretch the arms forward. Now you're going to be doing this in dog pose in a second. Grip the sides of the mat if you if you if you have one if you have a, a you know a, ver, a, rec, a rectangular mat otherwise just stretch forward good and and now from there externally rotate the upper arm and lift the mat up as if you're pushing it forward but at the same time lean your trunk and hips back so your sacrum moves toward the heels not toward your head and lift just underneath the elbow without crowding your neck and breathe all right that's good come on out my friends now Quick dog pose. Watch how Patty's going to do this again. She's going to start by holding the sides of the mat with her hands. So you see her fingers are under and her thumb is on the top. Already it externally rotates the arms. Then she's going to lift the mat up a little bit and pull it forward to stretch it more. Ah, and then she's going to maintain that as she exhales and lifts her feet and goes into the pose. And then we'll go from there. All right, so everybody do it. Grab the sides of your mat. While your knees are down, 
rotate those upper arms even more. Then before you add your legs, lift the mat a bit and push it further forward, stretch your arms completely. So your elbow head comes up and then exhale, up you go with your legs and breathe. All right, now remember this because the next pose we'll do will have more challenge to it. Every pose has a body set, a mindset, and a breath set. What does that mean? That while you're holding the pose, if you get no other details, the body set is what is your body mirroring back to you? What is you doing? What are you doing? You did something, so what are you doing? But then there's a mindset. There's a little commentary often that goes on, a running commentary. Meg, if arms flat is hurting, you can do interlocked fingers, elbows on the floor. So the mindset, what thought forms, the chitta, what, what vrittis, what waves are coming in your mind as you're doing this? And then the breath set, how is it affecting your breath? And if you add a detail like stretch your toes forward and activate them and pull your heels back away from the arch, did something just happen? All right, so now you're in a different body set. What's the mental set that goes along with that? And then how is your breath affected as a result of that? All right, one more time. Oh, are you okay, Meg? All right, last few seconds. Remember where you had the block in your thigh in Tadasana at the beginning of the class? So roll the lateral thigh in from outside, stretch the inner thigh back from front to back, and widen the back of that lateral hamstring as you stretch the heel down and the buttock up. Now notice, body set, mindset, breath set. All right, exhale, down you go. All right. So we got 23 minutes to finish this fiasco off. So now let, let me continue. Meg, if putting weight on your elbows doesn't feel good, you can sit in the chair with your hands in a headstand. All right, so I wanna explicate a little bit more about the body set, mindset, and breath set as we go into this next headstand variation. This is a triumvirate that feeds each other. That if you increase your awareness of one of them, the other two get fostered or encouraged to show you what they're saying, right? Like each one has like a me too voice that's gonna to communicate to you. But if you neglect one or don't work one, then the other two are impacted by you're not paying attention to it. So when you do the pose, right, how you breathe and how you think about the pose affects how you actually do the pose with your body. And how you breathe in any pose affects the way you think about the pose and how you do the pose. And then of course, how you place your body in any position and what it immediately responds to teaches you what mental state you're in and how it affects your breath. So when we do this next position, right, it won't be beyond your ability to do it. It'll just be challenging. Lori, my heart goes out to you. Thank you so much. I saw what you wrote about that I'm able to take the most basic asana and make it challenging and hopefully fresh. Thank you so much. It's true. <laughs> but the reason it's true is like, see, I was, never I was never able to get past the intro level now. I would probably flunk the intro teaching now, but you know, but at that time, we, they gave us a, a pretty easy pass, not like what it, what it evolved into. But that's what I really learned from the master. You can't even master Tadasana. The varieties of the most basic pose you can think, it's unending. It's limitless. This is what they talk about. Settle your mind in the infinite. There's a potential that we're never going to tap it. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. How could you be bored with a practice like this? So... If you can do headstand, we're gonna show you this with your head on the floor. If you can't do heads and if you can't do headstand, and then you're gonna do pinch of my arasan arms, but with the same variation. So we'll challenge your shoulders and we'll challenge your head and neck, depending on what you can do. Now, I am so stiff for the people out there who wanna know about what do you do when you have an old man who has rheumatoid arthritis and is challenged. I can't I can get to the floor. But really, I'm, I'm calling on my inner Marine. I'm calling on my, like, you know, you're a rockhead from Brooklyn. If you got to do it, I'll tough it out like that. 
But if you're asking me if I was my own teacher, have some compassion on this guy. Don't you see what the hell he's going through? I would have my hands on a chair. I'd have the same block configuration with my palms, but I wouldn't be bearing weight on the floor. It's still challenging. I still got to be a Marine, but not like, like a Navy SEAL where like they've put me through such training, like I can you know, torture me and I'm not even giving up the name. You know? No. All right, now let's get back to Patty. <laughs> so with that being said, remember your mindset, your breath set, and your body set when you're doing this. All right, Patty. So first, we're going to show you, you know, you're going to turn around. Yeah. Like gonna, no, 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 because we want to see your elbows. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. My, my fault there. You were right. Go ahead. All right. So Patty's setting up so that we're going to see her elbows when she goes up. She puts her hands in the headstand position, just so you can see at the beginning. You, you got to go further back, Patty. I, I, I can't see. It. Keep going. All right. So this is what we just want you to see. Her arms are holding here so that when she puts her head down, right, the block is in front of her inner elbow. That's what it looks like from the back, right? So now she turns around. You have to figure out this distance because most students don't do this. So she gets up, she exhales, she does her breath. She does, you know, wrist press down, elbows stay in line. Shoulders lift, she walks in, she opens up so you can see how her wrists are like this. She has it to the extreme edge of her elbow. And then she goes up if she can, one leg, two legs, whatever. She's doing that just so you can see. And she joins her legs. And now, if I say to you, squeeze the block with your elbows right there. See the action? And she'll immediately show you how the left elbow, it cheats right away, right? Tell everybody how it cheats right away, Patty. She's right away. She throws herself right under the bus. No excuses. Yes. Mm -hmm. So she, see, it's the training device. Now, she still has to press the wrist bone down. She still has to lift the shoulders up. She still has to activate her legs. He says, Shirshasana is nothing but an upside down Tadasana. She still has to do that. But now she has to go back. See the left elbow? She lost it again. Pin it in. Pin it in. Yeah. Now, come down even with bent knees, but pin it in the whole way. Watch how difficult it is. Pin it in the whole way. See, and right at the end. So tell everybody how difficult that was, Patty. That's really hard. So that's what I mean, because Sir Shasan is a level one pose. I know for a raw beginner or somebody with a neck and shoulder, it, but then yoga takes you to the Cirque du Soleil thing. So now show her what happens when you do it just with the arms. So now side view. So here, she's putting the block this way. She's doing with the palms facing inside to the block, pinning the elbows in the same way, and now her head should be off the floor. And if she just walks in her legs in like dog pose, but challenges the elbows in, that would be plenty. And let your head go. Your head should be hanging completely. Keep launching your body toward the legs. There you go. That's enough. Down you go. So that will be plenty. Any one of you who doesn't go up into headstand, that will take you to the end of your tether. If you, especially if you keep challenging the, if, no, don't let me be the whipping boy. I shouldn't have to keep saying to you, which elbow is touching the block? Which one is not? Which one has lost it? Which one, do, recover. Because remember, you connect, you see the disconnect, you reconnect. Hope you're going to take that one with you, Laurie. All right, so let's go. Find out your way. Either with the head on the floor, I don't care if you're balancing freely, you can be against the wall. The key is just to learn how to keep the arms in, all right? If you want to do the arms on the floor like modified Pinchamayarasan, then hold it and come on in any amount, walk, get up. And then once you're up, stop, take a breath. People on the floor, just walk in, keep the arms going. And then watch your breath set, watch your body set, watch your mind set. The base of the pose is the part we always come back to. So it's your arms, right? Elbow, forearm, wrist, fingers. So pin those elbows into the block. See how quickly you lose it. Is that challenging, Lori? Yes, it is. I'm losing my hand position. Okay. Yeah, it is. It's hard. My left elbow wants to wing out. Right. Heidi, how are we doing? 
Okay, good. So squeeze those outer thighs in, squeeze the outer knees in, open up the foot, use your whole back body to lengthen up off of the waist so it isn't all on the upper body. The legs have to help you. What's the purpose of the standing poses if you can't independently stretch your legs up? Now, if you feel your armpit is collapsing, 30 seconds more, then from the back of your shoulder socket, like you'd be screwing a screw from the front, from the back to the front, screw the shoulder socket straight ahead into your armpit and go up. All right, take a breath. Inhale and exhale. Take your time, don't flop out. Remember, entering and exiting is the pose. Come on down. Pin that elbow. Way to go, Heidi, that was very, very nice. Just for my own edification, Heidi, would you do me a favor? Can I see you, can you go up independently without the wall? Can I see you do it once, please? Okay, great. That's good, come on down. Okay, so Heidi, I'm, I'm making a personal extension. After this workshop ends, I would love to share something about sh headstand because you know, I don't have that many students who can go up independently. And of course, whenever I find somebody who does, I, I like to offer something else to help go further, if you'd be willing afterwards. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, so now, um, what did you do to relax your head and neck? Anything. Do child's pose, put your forehead on a block, and relax your neck quickly. All right, take a breath in and out. Get ready for transition and come on up again. <clears throat> All right, if you're okay, I won't hear anything. If your neck doesn't feel good, speak up and let me know. And we'll give you something else to do. All right, for time's sake, we're gonna cut out one pose here. We're gonna go right to Pasasana, noose position. So Patty's gonna show you two different ways. If you are flexible enough to be able to squat next to the wall, assuming you have a wall space, and Patty, can get down, but she's adding a little shim for underneath her heels. So that means if the Achilles tendons are so tight that you can't get all the way flush, then at least you can get this tilt and that'll be helpful. And then what she does is she exhales, she sinks down into the wall, uh, and then she tilts to her right and she uses the, she's going to her right. So she uses her left arm to the outside of her right knee and she wedges it into the wall if she can, and she lowers her left arm so the forearm is kind of horizontal to the floor. So she's challenging her knee and arm against each other. Then she's leaning her whole body diagonally toward that outer right knee and taking her head and chest back in space like a backbend. All twists have a backbend component. And then she raises her right hand just a little bit on the wall and she drags the paint of the, uh, down from her fingers toward her elbow to increase the lift of her chest as she twists more. And then she turns her head to the front shoulder as the final piece. And again, the bottom of the spine is lifting up from bottom to top, but the skin of the upper back is moving down from top to bottom. Same thing you've heard before, great. Now, come on up. Now, if you can't get down like that, did we show it in the chair? Um. Yeah, I think we did. So she's gonna move the chair to the center of the room and you're gonna sit on it facing straight ahead. No, no, no turn the chair to, the, to the, your right there. No, no, the other way. Uh, there. Fine, either way. Okay, good, now sit, face that way, good. So Pasasana in the chair, it really helps. She's gonna lean, fo come forward a little forward so she gets a little diagonal lean from her body and then she's gonna stretch her arms up and she's gonna cut the outside of her right hand to the outside of the left knee. And she can use her left hand on the chair seat behind to open up the chest and rotate that there. Ah. 
And then in the same way, she's going to continue to diagonally lean toward the outside edge and wedge it in more. And as a brace, using it against it, squeeze the legs together, squeeze the hips together, take the upper body back in the back bend, and then use the top arm um, on the back of the chair like that. Nicely done. All right, so everybody, pick a way to do it. Good work, my friend. Let's see where you are. All right? So against the wall, either wedge the elbow or on the chair. Now, again, you might not be able to get your arm all the way across the chair. That's okay. Walk for, move further forward on the chair and then slide the outside arm. Sometimes I use a fist position right on that right arm, Meg. Yeah, there you go. Good for you, Robert. So now people against the wall. Remember, you want to brace the knee, but challenge the outside knee in and swing your hip away from the wall. Yes. Then take the raised arm on the wall and drag the paint down to lift your front body up or from the back body. Remember, bottom spine lifts from bottom to top. Back skin drops from top to bottom. Then turn your head over the front shoulder, everybody. Nice, like that. And breathe. Yes. Elongate. Twisting is lifting. And turn your head over the front shoulder, yeah? And keep both sides of the neck level when you do. Don't shorten the neck as you turn. All right, inhale, exhale. Come on out. Take a breath. Oof, that was good. And set up the second side. No need to wait. So Malasan, very good posture anyway. Strengthening your knees, your ankles. The older you get, you want some resilience in your lower limbs. So that simple things like stepping off a curb or going up and down on a stair doesn't cause you to trip because you're too inflexible. All right, so um, Meg, hold your right hand on the top back of the chair, yeah, and bend the elbow so it can help you rotate that side, yeah, there you go. Then raise the arm up, cut it to the outside, wait there for a second. If you can work the arm closer and closer to the outside of the lower third of your thigh, do it. But remember, every time you inhale, lift your spine, every time you exhale, see if you can rotate without forcing. Now lean the spine diagonally. Yes. Now remember, when you twist, the ribs on the side you twist to poke out into a convexity. So suck the, the ribs on the side you're turning to into the center of the spine and then turn around a tighter central axis. And breathe. And always, don't hold, don't hold your breath. Be soft, be relaxed and be thankful for whatever range of motion you got. All right, inhale, exhale, come on out. Very good. Stretch your legs out ahead of you. Put a block between your feet and do Pachimottanasana. But don't forget to lift up the buttock flesh. So, just as a little review, you know, no matter what I do, I always try to get across in as clear a way as possible that in every class, find a way to flex your spine, find a way to extend your spine, find a way to rotate your spine, find a way to invert your spine. So this is a forward flexion. So was Supta Pada one. Supta Varasana was the extension pose. Even taking your arms over your head into Supta Urdhva Hastasana was a kind of extension pose. Pasasana was the twisting pose and then dog pose and the headstand variation was your inverted pose. Every class, I try to somehow work that in till it becomes clear in terms of how you do your own sequencing. Now, just as when we did Supta Pada Ungustasana 1, I said it's the front of your thigh that has to stretch as much and not just the back of your thigh. So when you're doing a forward bend, it's not just the back of your body that has to extend, it's the front of your body that has to extend. So in the same way, you grip your legs to the floor and you hold the weight, because once you start extending the front, the pressure on the legs gets greater. So the legs tend to get slack. So keep the legs going and make the effort to make the front of your anatomy from the pubis, right? Lower abdominal area, center of the sternum to the collarbone. So it leads the spine. All right, everybody breathe in, breathe out. Basta, basta, basta. Time to relax. Yes, it's that time. You can put your calves up on a chair. You can cover yourself with a blankie. You can put blocks under your wrists. 
bolster across your knees or buttock, whatever. Whatever is your favorite way of giving yourself a little peace. Cover yourself if you want to. I don't want you to get cold. Don't forget to scoot your tush away from your waistline and widen, widen the buttock flesh. Just spend the first minute or so in a symmetrical scanning And you want to move into that place that is no longer controlling anything. You want to really watch. The breath will find its own level. There's nothing you need to do now. Let each sense organ drop down Everywhere, you should feel the weight of your body settle. Your forehead skin moves toward the eyebrows or your brain doesn't relax. So descend the eyebrows down and the upper lid is very soft and it's closing over the eyeball. Make sure that your tongue is soft and resting on the lower palate. And the perfect separation of the neck vertebra from the upper back vertebra enables your throat to float long while the shoulders gently move away from the skull. The skin of your outer upper chest spreading laterally and floating downwards. The skin of your middle chest spreading laterally and floating downwards. The skin of your lower ribs spreading laterally and flowing downwards. The skin of your diaphragm spreading laterally and floating downwards. Witness that state becoming yourself impersonal. And go on disidentifying yourself with your body dropped down as if you don't even exist in the body. With a quiet, soft, slow inhalation and a quiet, soft, slow exhalation. As you get ready to come back to your daily life, 
Remember that the end of every yoga session is a golden opportunity for you to program your own biocomputer. Things that we say to ourselves, the thoughts we have, have shape, form, and substance. It's to each one of us to cultivate the beautiful thought flowers we want to grow in our own garden, in the garden of our creative imagination, and to remove the weeds. Today's lesson in the Gita was so much about devotion and surrender that the affirmation for today is about communion. I have an open line to spirit. I seek spirit continuously. In any time of need, in any problem, I have constant contact with the all-sufficient, the source of all good. I take time to be still. I release myself from living beliefs, doubt, and fear. I'm filled with the joy of living. And refreshed, I return to my activities with new energy and vitality. I have an open line to spirit. And so it is, my friends, my in communion friends, may you all seek spirit continuously in whatever form unfolds for you. And remember, in any time of need, in any problem, you do have constant contact with the all-sufficient, the source of all good. So take time to be still. Release yourself from limiting beliefs, doubt, and fear. So you can be filled with the joy of living. And when you leave here today, may you honestly be able to say, I am refreshed, returning to my activities with new vitality and energy. May that ever be so. If you're drifted off and lost conscious contact with your breath, slowly float your awareness to the inhale and exhale cycles. And notice how the inhale is invigorating and uplifting and the exhale is tranquilizing and calming. So get a few cycles going so you feel a sense of both energy, the solar force, and with the exhale, the calm lunar, at ease, equanimity aspect of yoga. One more inhale coming closer to the surface with your gifts and talents, what I call the golden qualities of your personality to serve the world at large. And then with your final exhale, do your own form of surrender, offering your gifts, the benefit of all. And then mindful of any props that might be around you, inhale, bring your knees to your chest. With your next inhale, exhale, roll to your right, head down, chin down, heart down. Take a few breaths while you're there. And then tucking your chin so your head is the last thing to return to place. Tuck your chin to your chest, come on up. Okay. Namaste. So I'm doing better. That was 2.33, because I know time is important. We have so much things to do. We can't slow down. We got to get to our next thing. You know? But anyway, it was wonderful. I hope you got what you came for. I'm staying here for a couple of minutes, just in case somebody has a question, they want to go over something like that. And then Heidi, do you have a way to email me? Yes. Yeah, email email. Me, create something like that. Patty, how about a hand for Patty again? She does such a great job. Thank you, Patty. You know, and, I, and she never knows what I'm going to pull on her. So she really is, she's living on the edge, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's great. So again, thank you. So uh, again, any comments or questions and stuff like that? If you don't want to do it now because you don't want to come out of your Shavasana groove, I understand. Feel free to get in touch with me. And the recording will be made available at some point in the near future, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll send it out later today. So. Good. So, so again. Unfortunately, the, the format, if we could do a lot, I'm, I'm very conscious of not wanting to keep people in front of the computer too long. Yeah. But, you know, the, these issues are so weighty and there's so much to elevate the conversation. So again, if this is not the right format, even for a short dialogue, so it turns out to be more of a monologue, I'm not apologetic for that, but I'm just saying, you have to contact me outside of the class if you want to discuss this stuff more, you know, don't stay in on ceremony. Good. Yeah, it, Zoom is great, but it is hard to have big conversations on Zoom. And, and again, there's fear yeah. of public speaking, right? It's always there. People, yeah. you know, maybe I'll say something stupid. This is a stupid question. What do I have to put? You know, all those things. 
there's a lot of reasons why people don't, but whatever. Gabriel, I, I have a question though. You, I think you had said that there's ceremony versus ritual. I did. Yeah, it's one of my one of my big clarifications in how we sometimes use words and water down the meaning so much. So a ritual process indicates a change in ontological status. So it's it's taken from the rites of passage idea, right? But once you understand what they're talking about, it's any kind of shift that breaks the status quo and breaks through or erupts into your life that makes you never the same as you were before. So a ceremony is something where it just restores your persona. It makes you better capable of going back and, and handling the same old, same old. It's a coping device in a certain way. So it waters down. So for instance, with all due respect to the fact that do people have revelatory experiences when they go to religious tra traditions? They do. But then there's an idea of, remember I said, Carl Jung said religion is, organized religion is a way of preventing religious experience. So you can go there, for instance, and have the same oath, the same liturgy, and the same song, in the same way, with the same one round of people, white people clapping, and then it like falls, or, it's not a gospel church, you know. And you, got it? So a ceremony is nice, and it is nice. You go there, the stained glass is beautiful, the architecture is beautiful, the smell of the censer is nice. Everybody goes up, there's a little thing, you take the thing. But for most people, you're back to where you are 15 minutes later, you're still watching NFL football on Sunday, right? So that's a ceremony. And I'm not, you know, and I've participated in many ceremonies and they've been beautiful and they're deep. But I'm just saying the one edge that it has in the ritual is somebody is not who goes in ain't the same as who comes out. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, thank you. And yeah, ceremony is a type of play when you talked about play first um, in this session. So that's, but ritual, yeah, that, so yeah, I'm just making a connection. Yeah, ritual is play too, but you know, again, to me, when you have a ritual, to some extent, the ritual also bleeds into something that's sacred which means it's connected usually to a mythology or some kind of big picture story. Whereas in a ceremony, you know, all right, we're giving, we're giving you the reward, for, you know, for being like, you know, the best Shriner this year. Now, I'm not saying, you know, the guy might have been doing great service and to honor him that way is both secular and it has some kind of religious connotations that like people recognize you for like the contributions that you make. But in a certain way, it keeps you in, it wraps you back in and the ritual is supposed to spin you out. And, and again, one bleeds into the other, but I'm saying I make the distinction by it has much more about changing your ontological status. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you get your tooth knocked out, you get a, you know, you get a scar burnt into your leg, you know, you, you fasted for 72 days and you took peyote or something like that, you know, it's just not you anymore. That's why they give you a new name. Mm -hmm. And so forth. Judith, it's good to see you. Unmute yourself. Hey, Gabriel, I have to cut out. I'm going to make you the host so you can stay on, okay? Yeah, wonderful. Okay. I have somewhere I got to go. Speak to you for the next week. Yes. All okay. right. You guys so you're now. officially the host taking I'm over. I'm good. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, I can't. I can't. I, I don't have you unmuting yet, yet, so I can't hear your voice. Hello, the littlest yogi. She stayed in the whole entire time. How good. How oh. sweet. She is a little yogi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's happening there. Can't get her sound, her audio going. All right. Patty, I'll be speaking to you. Take care. They're gone. Thank you so much. So dear. Okay, so at some time, you know, I would just like to show you another way of strengthening your way of getting into headstand because you already have the basic strength and you just need a little coaching um, to, to, you know, take a ne next level. What, what's the next level, right? Yeah. So you let me know when you're free. We only need okay. like you know, 10 or 15 minutes and we can do that. You know, I don't want to do it now where your energy is nice and mellow. So would that be okay? Yes, I'd love that. Right. So send me a few times in this next week or so um, before the next class. Are you signed up for all the classes? I am. Okay, good. So send me a time, you know, before next uh, Thursday and we'll pick a mutual time and then we'll Zoom it together, okay? Okay. 
Sounds wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.